And thank you very much for being on the programme uh, this morning. We just heard from Keir Starmer in the interview. Uh, he, I asked him if he really believes that Rishi Sunak doesn't think paedophiles should go to prison, uh, as in the attack ad uh, that Labour put out. And he says, yes. What's your reaction to that? Well, I think, first of all, I think people listening to that will think that's nonsense. The, you judge people, I think, in politics by what they do. Uh, people remember it wasn't that long ago that the Prime Minister set up a task force specifically to deal with one aspect of that issue, which is to deal with grooming gangs, which is a subject the Labour doesn't even want to talk about. So I think if people judge the Prime Minister by his actions, they'll see that the substance of that ad was nonsense. I think the second aspect is I think politics also ought to be focused on, you know, what people actually do and the policies they set out. And I think personal attacks are not very helpful. Many, many politicians, you know, particularly female politicians, have to put up with a lot of abuse, online abuse, and I think all uh, people in leadership positions should be trying to conduct politics, uh, I think, with a slightly different tone. So I think it's a very di disappointing approach from him, but I, I don't actually think the public will, will buy it, actually. I mean, I guess Keir Starmer's argument uh, is that, look, it's right to focus on the uh, number of people uh, who have been let off for some of these really serious crimes and the Conservatives' record on crime over the last 13 years. Well, look, it's fair to focus on policy, but that isn't what they're doing in the attack ads. And actually, we've got very tough laws on those serious offences. But in the end, sentences are set by judges. Um, you know, no, no one's... I don't think anyone's turning around pretending that Keir Starmer's responsible for all of those um, sentences that took place when he was a member of the Sentencing Council and actually responsible for setting those rules. I mean, if Although he says start... he does take responsibility for that, at least. Well, yeah, he might say that. But the fact is, if he's going to apply his own argument, then he has to say that he's guilty of the same things as he's accusing the Prime Minister of. I just don't think it's a very good way to conduct politics. You should focus on the issues, and the Prime Minister's demonstrated on this subject, in what he set out the other week on cracking down on one aspect of it, which is on grooming gangs, that he's actually very tough on it, and I think that's how people will judge him. You talk a bit about the tone in politics and what MPs are subjected <clears throat> to, and it did just make me think about the story about Stella Creasy, the Labour MP, mm -hmm. uh, where she uh, completely, incredibly, uh, was contacted by social services after mm -hmm. someone said that her children should be taken away because of her views on men. What, what's your reaction to that? Well, I think it's terrible. I think, look, we, we all disagree with each other. I don't always agree with Stella about some of the campaign she runs, but uh, I think the treatment that she's had to put up with is terrible. The treatment that many colleagues on my side of the House have to put up with is terrible. I think all MPs of all parties uh, have to put, uh, are putting up with a lot, and they shouldn't have to. People in politics, you know, we should all be able to disagree, uh, have robust disagreements, but it shouldn't descend into people's... Um, families being attacked or their personal lives being attacked. I don't think that's the right way to conduct politics. Do you think social services have questions to answer? Well, I don't know the specifics of that case, but I don't think people who are attacked because of the job they do um, should have their personal lives damaged in that way. <laughs> so I think, you know, whoever's been involved in this should look at the facts of the case, and I think it's clearly appalling. Um, we've got local elections uh, fast approaching. Uh, Keir Starmer says you should be making gains. The Conservatives should be putting on seats. Uh, Oliver Dowden said last week that he expects you to lose a 1,000 seats. So what is going on? You know, is the truth somewhere in the middle? Well, look, we're obviously fighting very hard for every vote. But, I, I mean, I think, look, if you look at the independent commentators, the independent experts in this case, all the very respected ones, they, they're forecasting, you know, it's not our forecast, they're forecasting that they think we, we might lose uh, a 1,000 seats. So, I mean, if people want to judge things, that's sort of what the independent experts are but saying. But are they saying we're that going because... Out, are they we're saying going that, campaigning for every vote. Are they saying that because of how bad the situation is for your party? I mean, you last fought these uh, seats in 2019 when Theresa May, as Keir Starmer says, apologised, a few weeks later resigned and that was the end of her. I mean, that's the baseline and you're saying you're going to go backwards. Well, well no, we're not saying that. Look, we're not... Well, you are saying we're, that, aren't you? We're not <laughs> commentators. We're participants in this process. You know, we're going out, making our arguments very strongly. You know, we're going out, knocking on doors, fighting for every vote. All I'm saying is, if you want to judge where their expectations are, if you look at what the independent experts are saying, they're suggesting they think we're going to lose 1,000 seats. Um, because it's tough at the moment. Look, we acknowledge it's, it's tough on people. You know, there's a war going on in Europe. We're recovering from the pandemic. Inflation is high. That is putting people's finances under pressure. Um, and so it, it's difficult at the moment. We've obviously got very clear plan and one of our 
uh, our clear range of the five priorities the Prime Minister set out is to halve inflation, to grow the economy and to cut debt. I think if we can deliver on that this year, things will look much more promising. But, you know, it is tough at the moment. I think it's very sensible to acknowledge that. But, look, independent experts have made their forecasts. I mean, they say... They say I just want to pick up on that, because they're, <clears> they're not saying that that's definitely going to happen, that that's not seen. So it's just in the range of possibilities, right? Well, that's their forecast. Look, it's I, not their I, forecast, is it? it, it, it well, they're saying that it could be as bad as this. They're suggesting that that's what might happen. Look, what might happen, in, not what will happen. In the end, so I think it is important to qualify that. In the end, politicians right? are... You can't just the... cherry-pick the worst-case scenario. No, no, no. I'm just saying that seems to be where they're sort of saying is a, is a sort of expectation. Politicians, though, I think sensible not to get into the forecast Gay. We're about trying to persuade every single person listening to this programme that they should vote Conservative because Conservative councils, as ever, deliver better services at lower cost than okay. Labour and Liberal Democrat councils. So that's why people should vote for their Conservative council candidates. Uh, nurses go on strike from 8pm. <clears throat> uh, we're going to be speaking to Pat Cullen of the Royal College mm -hmm. of Nurses uh, shortly. Uh, what's your message to her? Well, well, look, of the pay offer that was offered to NHS staff, which we think was a fair and reasonable pay offer. Some of the largest unions in the NHS, their members have accepted that uh, pay deal. And obviously the Health Secretary is going to wait formally until Tuesday when the NHS Staff Council, which brings together all of those unions, formally reports back to him. But he stands ready to implement that offer subject to hearing from them finally. So clearly a lot of members working in the... A lot of workers in the NHS have accepted that fair and reasonable pay offer um, and he'll have to decide after Tuesday's meeting what the next steps are. But look, I I'd say to, to Pat Cullen, look, she, I think, agreed that it was a fair and reasonable pay offer because she and her, her executive recommended it to their members. Their members obviously haven't accepted it. Um, and obviously it's going to cause disruption in the NHS, so I would urge them to, to, to think again. Um, and to do what the other trade unions in the health service have done, which is to accept what I think is a fair and reasonable pay offer, reflecting the value that we do place on hard-working NHS staff. The point, you say that they should accept it because others have, but the point is, I guess, the nurses who work for the RCN, or the, the majority of them, didn't think it was the right pay offer. And, you know, if you look at um, pay, pay the nurses going back <clears> over the last decade, they have seen... Really difficult pay decisions made all the way back since 2010. The average pay of NHS nurses falling in real terms by 8% by since 2010. An analysis from the London Economics saying that the nurses' pay declined at twice the rate of private sector pay. You can see why they feel that they should be given you know, a decent pay rise. Well, they should be given a decent pay rise, and I think that's what they were offered. If you look at 5%. last year... Half if of you, inflation. If you look at um, last year, actually, when there was a, a public sector pay freeze, they specifically was a pay rise for nurses to reflect the value that the government places on them. And the pay deal that they were offered uh, would have given a, a band five nurse, so that's an average nurse, uh, over the two years of that pay deal, uh, I think something in the order of a £5,000 pay rise. So the government believes it was a fair and reasonable pay rise. Some of the other staff groups, uh, the GMB and Unison, have okay. accepted the pay rise. So, look, the Secretary of State will listen to what the NHS Staff Council says on Tuesday, um, but he stands ready, I know, to implement the pay deal that was offered if, if that's what the NHS Staff Council will report back on Tuesday. Unlike other strikes, um, originally there were no exemptions mm -hmm. for emergency care, so things like cancer treatment, A&E, maternity. They have now, after some hospitals like Great Ormond Street um, raised the alarm, if you like, said that in some local areas they will... Uh, provide cover. Are, are lives at risk over the next couple of days? Well, I think the thing that's very difficult here is that because they haven't agreed any national exemptions, it makes it very difficult for those individual trusts and the individual trust managers to put in place arrangements to deal with those areas like A&E, like cancer treatment. So what does that mean? Um, are you, are so you worried about lives it, being put it, at risk? It, it clearly does put patients at risk, which is why we urge the, the unions not to go ahead and, and do the strike. Um, clearly, if, if NHS staff are not working. I mean, all of those trusts are going to work really hard to put in place contingency arrangements. At local level, they'll all be working with uh, NHS staff to look at the contingency arrangements and doing their best. But clearly, there will be an impact if nurses don't come to work. Give us an update on rail strikes as well, if you may. Well, I, I think it's very damaging that the rail unions are calling strikes, specifically targeting... Um, the Eurovision Song Contest. I've, I've met with the head of Ukrainian Railways. The Ukrainian Railways are being specifically targeted by Vladimir Putin. Rail workers are being killed in their hundreds. And I would have thought, frankly, rail workers would have wanted to stand in solidarity with them 
rather than targeting the Eurovision Song Contest, which, if you remember, it, it's not our song contest. We're hosting it, but we're hosting it for Ukraine. And I think cynically targeting events, the hard-working, working men and women across the country are spending their money on to try and attend, and targeting those, I think, is very cynical. There's been a do film... You, do you take a bit of responsibility for this as well, right? Because, you know, Rishi Sunak says that he is the great deal-maker. That, that's mm -hmm. how he's trying to portray himself as Prime Minister. These strikes have been going on for absolutely months now. And look, if you kind of zoom out, we have a government that is effectively... The relationship between the government and the people who keep this country running has broken down. So, you know, the people who, you know, care for our sick in hospital, the people who teach our children, the people who drive the trains. Do you not take some responsibility for that as well? Well, look, when I got this job, I thought it was good to reset the relationship. I met all the trade union leaders. Well, has it hasn't really worked, has uh, it? Well, well, I remember you saying well, that to us. And, you it, know. it has, because if you look at a lot of the workers in the rail industry, so RMT workers who work for Network Rail, so that thousands of workers who work on the infrastructure, actually, they've had a fair and reasonable pay offer. RMT put it to their members, and the members overwhelmingly accepted it. 90% turnout, 76% in favour. What's happening here is that the RMT executive isn't putting the third pay offer that they've had from the train operating companies. They're refusing to put it to their members. Now, my view is if they put it to their members, if you look at what they did on the network rail pay deal, I think their members would accept it. So my call to the union executive, this is not aimed at the hard-working men and women who work on the railway, their executive should put what is a fair and reasonable pay offer. It's very similar to the network rail. Put it to their members, let them decide and not target the Eurovision Song Contest and the FA Cup final hitting hard-working men and women up and down the country. In this long-running dispute, I'm talking about the rail, railways, I'm talking about the schools, I'm talking about the hospitals, <clears throat> is there something that you think, in retrospect, the government should have done differently? Well, look, I think the government's having to deal with two very difficult things here. What we're trying to do... I'm not asking do... about what you have to deal with. What, what should you have done differently? Like, looking back and being honest, what, what should the government have done differently? Well, I think if you look at the fact that... Take the NHS, which you were talking about. If you take the fact that, actually, the biggest trade unions and their members have accepted... The so you haven't done anything wrong pay. at no, all no, in the last, you know... No, I'm not nine, saying that. Nine months a year, I'm saying nothing if you, wrong. If you look at the overall... Look, we can all go back and look at individual things, but if you look at the overall... Go on, then, that's what I'm asking you to if do. If you look at the overall position, we've made fair and reasonable pay offers. They've been accepted now by some of the biggest NHS unions and network rail staff have settled. So you can't name a single so... thing the government's done wrong? I mean, don't you think that's part of the problem? I no, I, but I don't, I don't... It's not very humble, uh, is it, when you're like... These, these are people who are, like, on, on low-paid jobs, many of them, working really hard, and, and you can't say a single thing the government's done wrong. Well, I don't think it's very... I don't think it's very helpful to just go back over the history and think, what could we have done differently? I'm focused on what we're doing going forward. I think... And, by the way, on train drivers, they're actually pretty well-paid, actually. The average salary of a train driver is £60,000 a year. I said many and of the, the people who are going on yeah, strike, yeah. and I'm talking about and nurses, the, I'm talking about ambulance but drivers, of the ones I'm talking I'm, about... All but of the ones I'm responsible for, train drivers get sixty thousand pounds a year. The pay deal they've it's been offered—it's very easy to pick, like the one, the one people, the pay one group deal, who well, you feel the like pay deal they've been offered would take their average salary to nearly sixty-five thousand pounds, and they won't even put that pay offer to their members. And so my my argument What's is: What's the average salary members, of nurses then? It's not uh, 60,000 a year, is no, it? it? No, it isn't, and I wasn't pretending it was. But that we've made a fair and reasonable pay offer to NHS staff, which has been accepted by the largest health unions, the members of the largest health unions. Um, and as I said, the Secretary of State will get their formal feedback on Tuesday. OK. Um, we had the last flight out of Sudan. The ceasefire mm -hmm. is coming to an end. What will happen to British nationals, nationals who may still be in the country? The, the, well, the, the evacuation that we've conducted is the longest and largest evacuation of any Western nation. We've taken out, I think, 1,888 British nationals, which I think is a testimony to the hard work of both those on the ground who've put themselves at risk and also those working um, at HQ to, to get that evacuation in place. We've now got some staff based at Port Sudan, which is where we're going to continue providing consular support for British nationals that have chosen to remain in the country. But we, we were very clear with our messaging about the need to get people out while the ceasefire was in place. You'll have seen there was an attack on a Turkish aircraft a couple of days ago, demonstrating that that evacuation was not without risk, and we therefore can't stay there indefinitely. But we were clear with British citizens about the need to get to the airfield to evacuate. And I say, we've taken out 1,888 British nationals. 
uh, and their dependents, which I think is, is a testimony to a very successful evacuation effort. And we will continue providing consular support from Port Sudan. There's a couple of other things I was just keen to get your uh, reflections on. Um, of course, there's been a lot of scrutiny about the BBC chairman who stood down <clears throat> uh, this week, mm -hmm. who resigned. Should that appointment now be taken out of government hands? The BBC, of course, is a, a publicly accountable institution funded by, through the licence fee, effectively by taxpayers. And that's why there's been a long-standing arrangement, you know, for the BBC chair to be appointed by the government. That's been true under parties of, uh, of governments of both political parties. That's a long-standing arrangement um, and we don't have any plans to change it. I guess the problem is that some think that this whole scandal came about because the government under Boris Johnson was trying to get their allies into this job, right? So wouldn't the best thing to do just to take all government uh, involvement out of the process going forward? Well, the BBC is funded effectively by taxpayers, not through taxes, but through the licence fee. So I think it's important that the government is involved in, uh, in making the appointment. And Rishi Sunak will clearly um, continue to implement the rules that uh, okay. are long-standing. So we've got no plans to change them. And I said, those are the rules that have been implemented by governments of both parties. And I think they've worked well over, over time. Uh, and you've got an announcement on uh, scams today. Just tell us what the idea is. Yes. <laughs> Areas of crime, fraud is one of the big areas that targets people. So what we're doing is cracking down and banning cold calling of people trying to market financial products um, so that we can then be clear with people that, you know, if you receive a cold call trying to market these things, uh, it'll be from somebody who shouldn't be doing it to try and give people that confidence. It's one of the areas that where crime is growing. We're seeing crime falling, violent crimes falling, neighbourhood crime is falling, fraud is one of the areas people are targeting and the government's being tough and cracking down on it, hence the announcement today. And just finally, um, there's lots in the papers about the coronation uh, <clears throat> next weekend. People watching on TV are going to be asked to pledge allegiance to King Charles as well. I don't know where you're going to be uh, on the coronation. Are you going to be pledging allegiance? Yes, well, of course, members of Parliament pledge allegiance mm. to His Majesty uh, as part of swearing of oath office, so I've already pledged allegiance to the King. Very happy to do so again, and I hope people do. I think, look, coronation is going to be a fantastic opportunity, not just to focus on our history and our constitutional matters, but also it's a great showcase for Britain around the world. We're going to have hundreds of foreign dignitaries coming here, and it's a great opportunity, I think, for Britain to demonstrate all about our country that's great, our fantastic values, and we can all get behind and support um, His Majesty the King. OK, thank you very much. Thank you.